I am sure you've heard of Suzanne Stabile, internationally recognised Enneagram teacher. Suzanne's been teaching for at least 30 years and has led at least 500 workshops. She basically inducted me into the Enneagram when her podcast, The Enneagram Journey, was one of the only ones out there. Suzanne's probably the most high profile teacher I've interviewed, so I was very keen to honour her time. When I knew I'd be speaking to her, I immediately got myself a copy of her latest book, The Journey Toward Wholeness. And it surprised me, honestly. I've read a lot of Enneagram books now and growingly selective about reading new ones, but this was a joy to read and contained, for me, some fresh ways of looking at the Enneagram. Our chat is about her book and we sprawled out a little towards the end. I've really enjoyed thinking about the connection between high side of stress point and self-care. I find stock advice for self-care unbearably dull and irrelevant. The idea that self-care for me looks like high side of type 2, well that's certainly worth exploring. I also like anyone who's willing to go out on a limb and put things in a sequence when it comes to development and speak about orders of priority. We need that with within the Enneagram, I think. I hope that you love this download from the very warm and wise Suzanne Stabil. most treasured teachers and one I personally treasured welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much. My dream is to be um, older and speaking to the Enneagram in uh, faraway lands. You do so, that already, right? Yeah, I do, but I want to be there. Have you toured in England before? Uh, no, uh, yeah. I, I've always wanted to. And people say, you should come. And I say, <laughs> okay. And then nothing happens. and so I've just finished reading Journey to Wholeness which I found to be very compassionate and practical guide to doing some pretty deep work with the Enneagram the timing of this book suggests to me it was worked on during the pandemic yeah did the pandemic help you to write the book and what was the pandemic like for you generally actually I sold the book to the uh, publisher before COVID Richard Rohr Father Richard Rohr has been a friend and mentor for me and a spiritual guide for my husband and me for a long time. And when I began to hear other people talking about liminality, I thought, wow, we we already know this. And he had talked to Joe and me about it, according to my journals, 20 years ago. So liminal space was already on my desk in terms of things that from time to time I would pick up and look at. And I believed even before COVID that we were in a time of liminality. Mm. And it has a lot to do with communication. It had a lot to do with uh, availability of information. Mm. Maybe one of my favorite teachings to share from Father Rohr is that information is not knowledge and knowledge is not wisdom. There's information everywhere and people as a result of that, have an opportunity to only avail themselves of information that agrees with what they already think, Mm -hmm. which I don't want for my children and grandchildren. I I want my grandchildren to be exposed to five ways of thinking about something, not one. And I want them to be curious, not affirmed. So I knew that the Enneagram would have a voice in that if I started working with it. Mm-hmm. And so I did. And um, my goal with Enneagram wisdom is to reach a certain level of understanding, not mastering anything probably, but le- reach a, fir- a certain level of understanding, for example, of my number. And then the question is, okay, well, what? so what? I'm a two on the Enneagram. So what? And if you don't do more with that, then that either is an excuse for bad behavior or an excuse to not challenge myself and grow. 
or a way to differentiate myself from other people that doesn't involve much debt. Mm. So the next level then, which I worked with in this book, is having to do with triads and stress. Mm. And I don't I don't know that in my lifetime I will I know I haven't experienced anything more stressful than the pandemic. I don't know that at 72 I'm likely to experience anything mm. like that. And I was immediately aware in writing the outline for this book before the pandemic that if things are beyond my control, I revert to bad behavior in my number. When we revert to bad behavior in our numbers, it's not necessarily ineffective behavior, right? Like Mm. I I know how to be a two. Mm. I know when to schmooze people. I know how to get what I want. I, I know all the tricks that go with seeing the world the way I see it and with the base level of gifts that I have. And so when there's fear everywhere, my reaction historically all my life has been to just be more too. And the lack of balance that comes with that means that it is a, from the jump, it's an ineffective way of being in the world. It's effective in terms of my little world, but it's an ineffective way of being in the bigger world where I, I have a role to play wherever I find myself. And sometimes my role is silence and presence. And sometimes it's my voice. But if you can't manage the three centers of intelligence as they present in your Enneagram number, then you just stay in one. You stay in your home space. Mm. Would you describe this book as an evolution from your previous book, The Path Between Us? Or if you wouldn't describe it that way, how would you describe it? I would describe it as an evolution. Mm -hmm. So here's what I think happens. Once we know our number, we are fascinated with ourselves. Once you know your personality type, then that's all you can talk about. You see it everywhere and you you find yourself to be fascinating. Mm -hmm. Everybody does that. There's no critique in that. Everybody does that. But the next question that people ask is, okay, well, what about other people? What about the people I love? What about the people I work with? What about my next door neighbor? So that was the reason for writing The Path Between Us. However, if we uh, are uh, fancying ourselves to be on any kind of spiritual journey, then ultimately the questions are bigger than me Mm. and the people in the sphere of my life. The questions have to do with me and with God and with understanding maybe not who I am, which I think the Enneagram really helps us with, but who I could be. And that started me on the work that has to do with the third book, which we're talking about, which is the journey. Mm -hmm. And I think everybody's looking for wholeness. Everybody. I don't meet anybody who isn't trying to manage stress, understand themselves and their people, and find some kind of serenity in some holistic way of looking at the world. Mm -hmm. And the answer seems to me to be uh, balance. But, okay, balance what? Yeah. Right? And in Enneagram wisdom, what has already been laid out for us is that we need to balance our natural resources that we all have in equal measure, which are the three centers of intelligence of thinking, feeling, and doing. Mm -hmm. And that's not easy. It sounds easy, but it's not. Yeah, I agree with you. So let's get into some of the theory in the book. So, So you make the centers central I don't think that will surprise many people as I think the associations between you and the centers and especially the stances maybe are very strong in people's minds because that's always been core hasn't it to how you talk in a journey towards wholeness and balance the book proposes there are two main tasks so the first task is to name and manage the dominant center and then the second part of the book is about how to name and manage the repressed center 
So just a few observations, questions about this. So this business of identifying and naming the dominant centre can be incredibly subtle, can't it, Suzanne? Or, or at least that was my experience of it. And then the book offers a lot of guidance, actually, on how it looks to be dominant in a centre. But when I first came to the Enneagram, I didn't have the awareness of myself to recognise that I was a heart type. I was I was much more identified with my thinking centre. It, it took some time, actually, um, for me to to see that I was a that I was a feeling type. And imagine that's maybe a common situation. So what do you say to that? And how do you generally approach the issue of mistyping? Or, Well, my first way of talking about mistyping is very straightforward. Don't take the test. Okay. Don't take any test. Don't do it because it's not helpful. Mm. And here's why. Your Enneagram number is determined by your motivation for behavior mm. and not by your behavior. And when we first encounter the Enneagram, especially now that it's so trendy, and I'm thankful that it is, like that's great for me, but it's it's very trendy in the shallow end of the pool, right? And so um, I, I was immediately, when you said you thought you were probably in the thinking type, I was going to say, okay, tell me what you were doing during that time. What were you, where were you in life? What were you doing? Great question. So I was in a period of, ex- I was be- beginning to explore the inner life, which meant I was exploring lots of different systems, the whole works, like nonviolent yeah. communication. There was a lot of busy activity in the mental center going on. Right. Yeah. And so that makes you think that that's your dominant center. Mm. The one that you're using when you're first exposed to the Enneagram, yeah. the one that you're aware of using most, seems like that has to be it. The reality is, and Maurice Nicole said this years ago, and he's the one who named these three centers for us, at least mm-hmm. in modern awareness and knowledge and understanding. And he said, when something happens in the environment around us, we respond first with either, what do I feel? What do I think? Or what am I going to do? As a heart person, you know that you respond first with feelings. Mm -hmm. And you may not stay with feelings very long. I don't. I move immediately to my support center. Mm -hmm. She's doing that. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Once you've asked that question enough times, once you've observed yourself, which is the answer to everything in Enneagram work, you just have to hang out up here and observe yourself. Mm. But once you do that enough, you notice, oh, what feeling came first or thinking came first. Or and or you'll you'll if you're doing dominant, you'll hear yourself say, oh, I did that without even thinking. And I I don't think it takes a ton of hard work to locate yourself in a center. It once you know that it is triggered by how you respond to the environment, not by how you spend your days. Mm -hmm. That's a clear teaching of itself, actually, and and, and, an emphasis that I haven't, I don't think I've heard anywhere else yet. In describing how each type manages stress, you offer the point of accessing the high side of the stress point. Talk to me about that. Because that also is something new, at least to me. Um, how are people taking to that? Well, I've been teaching it for a long time. And, mm-hmm. and I'll, I'll, I I don't know anybody. There may be somebody. I don't know. But I don't know anybody who teaches that who didn't learn it from me. So I don't think it's been common, which is one of the reasons I wrote this book. What the, the two things I wanted to do that I felt like were my contribution at this point in life to the body of Enneagram work were to talk about stress in the way that we're about to mm-hmm. and to talk about the reality that you can bring up your repressed center and that that's where the magic is, which we'll talk mm-hmm. about, I mm-hmm. presume. So um, it has been taught all along that the move you make, and I think it has been taught based on assumption. Mm-hmm. And I think sometimes it's never even been named. It's just been assumed Mm. that once you understand that one of the lines on the Enneagram connects you to your security number and one connects you to your stress number. I think it was assumed from way back. Oh, well, when you're when you're secure, you must go to the healthy side of your security number. 
Mm-hmm. And when you're stressed, you must go to the unhealthy side of your stress number. Mm-hmm. And that's just not true. Mm-hmm. As I observed people, that's not true. And one of the gifts that I have is we have our own center here in Dallas. And I'm teaching the same people I was teaching 28 years ago when I started learning the Enneagram. And there's no way to tell you how much they've taught me. And I work with small groups of people. Now, I speak publicly in big arenas and all that, which is great. I like it all. But where I learn is when I'm teaching 40 or 50 people. And we're in conversation. And I watched them and listened to them. And I realized that sometimes when life is lined up really well and they're doing great, when they are secure, they behave badly in the number that they go to in security. When things are lined up perfectly or as perfectly as they ever are, Mm -hmm. things are really going well for us. And we make that intuitive move to the number we go to in security. Mm -hmm. Then I was noticing that people, including me, behaved badly there. So let me tell you where I I first decided it was a real thing. I'd been thinking about it for a little bit. And then my life kind of just had a sweet spot, you know, where everything was good. All the children were good. Grandkids were good. Joe and I were great. Everything, you know, everything was good. And I was becoming self-indulgent. Like I I deserved to be treated in a certain way and I deserved to have certain relationships. And I, I, uh, I should only have to do what feels important to me. And I was journaling about that and reading back through my journals. I realized that that was all unhealthy for Mm -hmm. and for is where I go in security. Yeah. Yeah. So there's that. So since there was that, I thought, well, then. What about security? Mm. And and the reality is that you cannot take care of yourself without the number that you go to in stress. You can't do it. And so I began to watch myself and I thought, well, when I'm really stressed and unaware, I just behave from the unhealthy side of eight and things get worse. But if I kind of climb the ladder up to healthy eight. That's where I've learned every tool I have to take care of myself. Yeah. So as a two, that's where I've learned to say no. That's where I've learned that I have to have boundaries. That's where I've learned that I can be confident in who I am without falling prey to all of the cultural things that suggest that I have to be different. That's where I have learned to hold to what I believe unapologetically and allowing the chips to fall where they may. Mm-hmm. All of it I learned from healthy eight behavior. So I started suggesting to these people that I get to hang out with and teach, I think you can make that move. I don't know that you'll make it intuitively yet, mm-hmm. but after you learn to make it intentionally, then I think you make it intuitively, mm-hmm. which means that when I'm really stressed, then I know enough to know I'm going to be in eight behavior soon. I can choose the high side or the low side. Mm -hmm. I can choose healthy eight behavior. And the way you stay interested and willing and engaged to do the work is to remember that you can't take care of yourself without what you get there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And in some cases, I guess that maybe looks it's a little more difficult to see. So in two's two's case, it's quite easy to see, but sometimes it's going to perhaps look a little less intuitive. What do you think? I think that could be. So if we just took the two of us, Mm -hmm. when I have the opportunity to live in healthy four space for a a piece of time, Mm -hmm. I write books and I rearrange furniture and I go through catalogs to find a unique gift for my grandchildren for Christmas. Mm -hmm. And when I'm on the low side of four, I'm tired and I allow myself to be uh, whiny Mm -hmm. and uh, unacknowledged and unappreciated. Mm -hmm. When you come over to me Mm -hmm. and you're hanging out in my space because this is where 
you come when you're stressed. Then the first gift you have is that, and two, you see the world from the inside out instead of from the outside in. I, as a two, when I go to four, have to go inside of me and find out what's there. And you, as a four, have to go to stress Mm -hmm. and find out what's outside of you. Mm -hmm. Because you can't get out of stress because of the things you want in life Mm -hmm. unless you get outside of yourself. Mm -hmm. If your focus doesn't move to outside, and if my focus doesn't move to inside, we just don't get there. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I really want to get to the repressed um, the repressed okay. center teaching. The, the way that you've sequenced these tasks suggests that that's the order in which we can do the work. Is that accurate? Yeah, yeah. That is accurate. Mm-hmm. If you can't manage your dominant center, mm-hmm. then you don't need to be worried about stress. I mean, about stances. Like you can play around with them and read about them and do all that. You it, Balance occurs from both ends. And so you have to manage your dominant center in order to make space for bringing up your repressing. Mm. So let's talk about the power of um, bringing online the, the repressed center, Suzanne. And then maybe can you reiterate when that becomes relevant? So I think um, if you haven't figured out that you have to manage your dominant center, mm-hmm then stances is like window shopping. You you see it behind the glass and you're not sure what it's going to cost you, but you really want it. (laughs) And and then you even kind of get together the resources to go get it. Mm. But somehow it's very elusive. It's a disappointment. It's not what you wanted it to be. You know, it, my, my thing when I get to just shop for fun, which isn't very often with all these people I live with, but the, the thing that makes me happy is a new handbag. Like that's my thing. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I see it and I think, oh, I want that one. And that's the way it is with stances. Mm-hmm. And then sometimes I get it and it I didn't check it out first and I didn't look and I had one kind of like it already that works good enough and all the things that happen. So once you are done window shopping and you kind of try to bring it in, you don't have any place to put it because your dominant center is so big and your support center is so supportive of your dominant center that those two are just taking up all the space in your life. Mm-hmm. Those two are making decisions for your days. And in that reality with just those two, you make the same mistakes that you regret. You you visit the same regrets over and over and over and over. Mm-hmm. And it's because of a lack of balance. It's just because of a lack of balance. It's so, so disconcerting to me that we have what we need, but we don't know it. Uh, before we started recording, you talked about, or maybe after, mm-hmm. I don't know, at some point, <laughs> you talked about you, that you were looking at all these different systems and mm. you know, with all these different things. And, and I, I think that's such a good way for us to think about discovering the Enneagram because it's the only system I know, and I did the same thing you did, that shows you what's wrong and shows you how to fix it at exactly the same time. Yeah. It's all in the system. And you have the system, but you've got to get over being so enamored with the first two parts of it mm-hmm. and do the work of bringing up the third part. And unfortunately, just I'm sure it's fortunate in the wisdom of the world, but unfortunately for us in our laziness, just managing the dominant center isn't enough because that's work. And then you'd think, okay, there's room now. So the the repressed center can just slip right in here. Mm -hmm. No, it doesn't. (laughs) You have to go get it. You have to take it by the hand and bring it with you. Mm -hmm. You have to show it where it fits. And then you have to continually make space for it. It means practicing using the center that you least like. Mm -hmm. I had to um, make a big commitment. I like to teach. Mm. I'm a teacher who writes. Mm. I'm not a writer who teaches. 
I like to be in the room with people, Mm -hmm. not be in my office by myself. I like, right. And I have to bring up thinking in order to do what's mine to do, which I believe these three books were. I don't know if there's going to be another one, but I'll have to bring up thinking if there is. Yeah. And it's hard, hard work. Mm -hmm. Feeling wants to push it out. Doing wants to push it out. And I have to just sit with it. And and so actually, I sometimes when I'm writing, have to set a timer and say, I just can't get up from my desk Mm -hmm. until the timer goes off. And then. I can still stop thinking and just sit here and feel sorry for myself. (laughs) My daughter, Jenny, the second daughter, she's a nine on the Enneagram. And she called me one day and she said, mom, so she's doing repressed and doing dominant and doing repressed. So she's always doing something. But she called me one day and she said, mom, I'm trying to clean the kids' rooms. She had three littles at the time. And she said, "I, I literally have to block the door to finish one room before I go to another one. That's the that's representative of the kind of work that that we all have to do in order to learn to bring up and strengthen our repressed center. Mm-hmm. And I want to say here that the book contains a lot of guidance and suggestions for how to do that in each in each case for each triad. And um, yeah, it's notably absent from this book is a discussion of the instincts. You use subtypes, but they're not in this book. So implicit in that, you believe we can we can do the deeper work of the Enneagram, at the deepest work of the Enneagram, in fact, without opening the instincts can of worms. Is, is that accurate? And let me tell you why I think it, it's very important to do a bunch of work before you do that. Mm. The instincts require the exact same amount of work because you're supposed to be balanced in all three of them. So I don't know how old you are, and I don't know if you want the world to know. I'm 39. I'm 72. Mm-hmm. Generationally, and I think globally, although I don't get to uh, study uh, other Enneagram and other cultures in other countries as much as I'd like to, but I think this is globally true. Mm-hmm. Many, many of my generation mm-hmm. have a, a very thin layer of self-preserving. In the United States, my generation, Mm -hmm. which is baby boomers, born between uh, 1948 and 54, 44, 54, 46, somewhere in there. My generation, we were raised by parents who went through World War II. Mm. It's 1946 and 1964. That's what I'm saying. I just couldn't get into it. But my generation, sorry about all that fumbling around. Our parents were World War II parents, and some of our parents were uh, Depression parents. Mm -hmm. And they raised us wanting us not to have to suffer and do without all the things they had to do without. Mm -hmm. So we also are the first generation that uh, advertising was aimed toward as children. And we grew up thinking we could have it all and we could always have it all. And Mm -hmm. then I'm of the age as a woman where they said you can be You can have children and have life at home and work in the workplace too. You Mm -hmm. can have it all. And I'm here to tell you, the answer is no, you can't. And and I did work and I did raise my children. I did a good job of both. Mm -hmm. And it was costs. It's very costly. Mm -hmm. You you can do it all, but you can't have it all. And so I have many friends who don't have enough money to live in retirement and to live as old as we are now projected to live. Yeah. Wow. So self-preserving has to be engaged now. But it's kind of late in life if you're 60. Yeah. To start looking at self-preserving and think, well, that might have some value. Now, I'm not saying I'm balanced in social and sexual either. Mm-hmm. You want me to keep talking about this? I'd okay. love. Right. Yeah. So uh, I think a lot of people don't know that your subtype or your instinct changes. Your dominant mm-hmm. instinct changes. Not you get to change it. It changes. Not you get to study and practice so that it'll change. Not That's not what I'm talking about. I'm mm-hmm. talking about it changes. So if you, if you look at the instincts as a, a cake, three-layer cake, let's say. Yeah. So you're supposed to have social for doing social things, sexual for doing sexual things, and self-preserving for self-preserving. Mm-hmm. 
And they could be identified also as how you relate to many, how you relate to one or two uh, intimate relationship, not sexual, but intimate and your relationship with yourself. Mm -hmm. So I was always social, dominant, then sexual, then this little layer of Mm self-preserving. And I was teaching in Austin, Texas. My daughters were with me. I had was on stage. My daughter came from way back mm-hmm. in the teaching space up to me on the stage. And I thought, what's happening? And she closed my notes and looked at me and said, Daddy's had a heart attack and we're leaving right now. Oh, wow. And I walked off the stage and followed her to the car. And it's a three hour drive from Austin to Dallas. Mm. And in that three hours, my dominant subtype changed from social to sexual. I didn't know that. I'd never thought about it, never read about it. And Joe's fine. Luckily, he drove himself to the hospital or this would not be a good story. But he uh, did that and he just pulled up. He'd been riding horses all day. and He just pulled up in front of the emergency room and walked in and said, I think I'm having a heart attack. So then he's home and he's fine and our life is back to normal, except that I'm I'm cloying. Yeah. I want to be with him all the time and I watch yeah. him all the time mm-hmm. and I call him all the time and I check on him all the time. Yeah. And it's because I was suddenly sexual dominant. Well, in our relationship, that's not how we had been living. And if you've heard me, you know that I think everybody needs a therapist. Everybody needs a spiritual mm-hmm. director. And he said to me, our therapist's name is Bob. And uh, he said to me, I think you need to go talk to Bob. You're just too much. Yeah. So uh, I think that's one example. Mm -hmm. One, I could tell you more stories since I put that on the table. People recognize that in their lives. And then they have their story of when that did or didn't happen. And then they start to work with that. Now, here's why I didn't put that in the book. Mm-hmm. Well, if you haven't figured out how to manage your dominant center, and if you haven't done a little work to bring up your repressed center, you're not familiar enough with either one to know what to do if your subtypes change. And that's why I think this work has to be done in layers. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, yeah, I'm sure that a lot of your students are aware of that idea and that, but. I wasn't, and um, I'm guessing many people listening to this probably wasn't either. I'm not sure I've ever talked about it on a podcast, actually. Mm, Really? Not even on your own, Suzanne? I don't don't believe I have. I think think you have some magic for bringing (laughs) stuff out of me. I'm just, maybe you're (laughs) sensing my curiosity. Um, All I know is in my tunis, I want to please you. Yeah, you know what? I'm not beyond that. I'm a, as a heart type, I relate. I think I spend yeah. a lot of time doing that. As well. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I noticed from your book that you're a big reader. There's lots of well, there's book references, and I'd love to hear about your love of reading. What part this plays in your life? And I do love to read, and mm. I do read a lot. And uh, it, it's interesting because part of my discipline for bringing up thinking Mm. is reading, but not memoirs, not biographies, not novels that have lovely, deep, beautiful stories about people. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because all that just feeds my tunis, right? So I've discovered that more than anything, reading triggers new ways of looking at Enneagram wisdom for me. I've been teaching the Enneagram for so long. And and I don't know if you know the story, but when I first learned the Enneagram, I learned it from Father Richard Rohr. Mm -hmm. And he challenged me after I had read a manuscript of one of his books. He challenged me in that moment to study for five years without talking about it. Yeah, I was aware of that. And it's incredible. And you actually did that. I did it. Yeah, yeah. I did it. And I think that's one of the reasons that reading triggers new ideas about the Enneagram for me. And for me, new ideas means new ways of connecting the Enneagram to the world that we're all living in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When we refer to something as ancient wisdom, which we do the Enneagram, that says to me, 
that this is a this is a thing that we need to be careful with. It's wisdom. And that means it stood the test of time. So how is it going to stand the test of our time with it, our stewardship, if we don't use it wisely? And wisely to me would mean if it's wisdom, then it must be relevant to the need that we have. Right now, I'm reading about moral injury. Mm -hmm. Everything I have been offered to read by the people who have encouraged me to have that be my next move. And um, it it is going to be. Anagram and moral injury is my next. That'll start for me in January. It's a big thing in our time, moral Mm -hmm. injury. People are doing things on a regular basis that we can hardly imagine. Yesterday uh, in the United States, there was a school shooting. Day before yesterday, there was a shooting, uh, not in a school, but in a store. Mm -hmm. The day before that, in the United States, there was a school shooting. Mm -hmm. That's moral injury. Mm -hmm. I'm a, a baby boomer, so my friends went to Vietnam. They came back with moral injury. People are just mean and out of control now, and that's moral injury. So that's what I'm reading, mm-hmm. and I'm really intimidated. We'll see if I have something to say. Oh. The people around me believe that I will by telling me that moral injury Healing moral injury requires storytelling Mm -hmm. and that I'm good at that. Mm -hmm. I would like all the good wishes I can get from every (laughs) corner of the world, uh, if that's mine to do, to do that and do it well. Because, you know, at 72, you you begin to think about, um, okay, if I did two more big projects Mm -hmm. or how, how much more work time do I have and what's mine to do, which you probably know is my big question. I love that question. Yeah. How do we stay up to date with you about that, about your work on this? Life in the Trinity hmm. Ministry.com. Yeah. Everything's always there. Yeah. I'll put the link in the episode notes. Yeah. SuzanneStabile.com will get it too. But mm-hmm. Life in the Trinity Ministry is a, a better look. And the podcast, of course, you'll be keeping people informed yeah. via the podcast, the Enneagram Journey. Yeah. You. Thank you, Suzanne. This has been such an honour, honestly. The next interview is with marriage and family therapist and coach and consultant Matt Ahrens. We're going to be talking about his journey as a nine to creating his work around the Enneagram.